today, I'll be real grandiose. We must reduce our dependence on foreign sources of oil. Lyndon Johnson said that, and Richard Nixon said that, and Jimmy Carter said that, and Ronald Reagan said that, all the way through President Obama. And the computer models suggest that if we don't find a non-fossil fuel form of energy soon, then climate change is irreversible, and we've got to figure out how to deal with a warmer Earth, right? Fusion is clean, no greenhouse gases, no long-lived radiation that we have to fight about where we're going to bury it. And because the Earth is two-thirds covered in water and the hydrogen in the water, there you get to the unlimited supply of electricity. And some people believe, you know, our community, and some people don't. You know, because if you hear about this, you go, wait a minute, either this is too good to be true and there's no possibility, or you're left with, this is crazy. This is the most important thing that we could be doing scientifically. And we, you know, wipe out disease and hunger and make a source of energy that never ever runs out, right? And offer it to the world. So fusion is when you combine two small, very small particles together, like hydrogen, right? Then the final combination, which is a helium atom with one neutron coming out, ends up being at a lower energy state. Hence, it releases energy in the reaction. It's energetically more stable. That wants to happen. So why is it hard to get there? Because of the Coulomb potential, right? As you get two positive charges close together, all they would want to do is repel. You need to get them close enough for the nuclei to touch each other and have this nuclear strong force take over. It's an attractive force that's stronger than the electric repulsion. And that will only happen by chance. It'll only happen when you get particles in a soup that's hot enough so that every once in a while, two protons are heading towards each other with enough energy such that before they get repulsed, the strong force takes over and grabs it and creates a new atom. And if the energy is not high enough, then the probability is either zero or very low. And if the energy is too high, it's also very low. And there's a sweet that's spot, the sweet. otherwise they won't fuse. Okay. How does the sun do it? Let's start with that question. Well, it's got a whole bunch of particles. You know, they're moving very fast and then the gravity from the sun is going, come here, don't go out. Keep on trying, keep on trying, right? It's in beautiful equilibrium. The sun is the balance between that pressure of the radiation out and the gravitational force going in. But we're in trouble because we can't do that, right? We need to have a better way of confining the plasma. It's just gonna either melt the walls or the walls are gonna cool down my plasma. So the big question becomes, what's the right container? So the way we do it is with a donut. That's what this laboratory is doing, is making a, a bottle. It's a magnetic bottle, right? Now, in a plasma, what you get is a soup, a whole bunch of charged particles, electrons, and positive ions floating around, yeah? When a charged particle is inside a magnetic field, it starts spiraling around it because the force is perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. That's why if we put a magnetic field that eats its own tail, now it's stuck without touching the walls. So that's the crucial part of magnetic confinement. So it's like the jelly in a donut not being able to touch the glaze because the magnetic field is right down in the middle of the jelly and it won't let the particles diffuse out towards the, towards the glaze. <laughs> There's helmets here for... Do I need to wear one? You do, yeah, yes. Do. Well, you can go here. When we make a plasma, there's kind of a complicated uh, time history of how we do it. So NSTX has uh, like all fusion, magnetic fusion machines at least, vacuum chambers and magnets. So that's the top of the vacuum chamber. That's a completely sort of a large cylindrical, cylindrical shaped vacuum chamber. And then in red here, coming out of the top and going down, are magnets. So those are called the troidal field magnets. And in blue, if you look there, you can see poloidal field magnets. So the blue are big circular magnets. How do you make a plasma discharge? So we start with the vessel pumped down, very low pressure in there, no magnetic fields, just sitting there inertly. Then what we do is we turn on these red magnets, the toroidal field coils, and they make the field that goes around the torus this way. The blue coils make a field that points up. That blue one right there, it's got current, and we leave them on without changing their current values for the duration of the plasma discharge. So they're on and they stay on. Then we turn on, at the same time, we drive some current in our solenoid. So we charge it one way, to about 26 kiloamps of current. Then we rapidly decrease the current in the solenoid. And as we very rapidly turn it off, that's what drives current in our plasma. 
Maybe there's a few random charged particles in the gas. They're accelerated by the electric field. Maybe they hit another particle and they, they hit an atom and they ionize it. Now you have more charged particles so that they can go off and hit things. And it's an avalanche process. And that's how you start by making this electric field and you can drive it into making a full plasma. So we got plasma there. It's not as hot as we'd like. So then we inject the neutral beams. Just a straight beam of deuterium atoms. Three beams, each of which is two million watts for six aggregate of six million watts. And those beams, energetic particles in the beams scatter and collide and transfer their energy to the bulk plasma. It takes about 300 milliseconds to sort of form that whole process. And then for 600 to say 1.5 seconds, 600 milliseconds to one and a half seconds, it's kind of just sitting there, steady state. It just sits there and we study it. Temperature is about a, a one kilovolt. And that's like 10 to the fourth times, it's like 10 million degrees. So all the machines you saw today, you know, before you talk to us, were just different ways to make a magnetic bottle. And there's other people you can read about that use electric fields. They use lasers or they, whatever it might be. But in the end, because we can't use gravity to cause, fear, we got to do it some other way. Because there's two questions, right? There is the, can we build the machines that can do this, right? That's the first question. And we say yes, and we can debate that scientifically, and we can debate the engineering and the technology and all those sort of things, right? But that's not enough to make usable electricity. You also have to have everything else in place so that the energy that you create has to be competitive economically with the fossil fuels or with fission or with solar or with wind. I mean, if we get there, and we will get there, it's a game changer. That part's, you know, not the hype. So why don't we have it, and how long is it going to take? I would say currently the answer is never, unless we are really serious about funding this. If we're wrong and we can't do it, then the planet goes on to whatever it does, right? If we're right, it changes the planet as we know it, because it's a completely new paradigm in a source of energy. Right? So the question becomes, are we willing to take the risk to find out if we're right? I mean, don't you want to be a part of something that changes the planet? <laughs> That's the bottom line. We try to create a pipe that guide the photons and the atoms into that pipe. So there's no way they can avoid each other. They have to interact.